Today, you are going to learn how to play one whole step higher on the trumpet in one week. Sound unbelievable? This is installment three, or trumpet lesson three in this series on how to play higher in one week. Let me give you this friendly warning. This is not gonna be a tutorial, a trumpet lesson about long tones, or lip slurs, Yeah, so I'm not going to give you that generic advice that you already know or that you likely have already found on YouTube or that you likely have heard from your trumpet instructor, especially if you're a trumpet major at some college or university. You're not going to get that here. You already know it or it can be easily found on YouTube. Before I continue, please make sure to subscribe to this channel to get amazing and unusual trumpet lesson tutorials. By the way, also lessons for tuba, trombone, cornet, flugelhorn, French horn, baritone, euphonia. Yes, it's all here at Trumpet Sizzle. So subscribe right now and hit that little bell notification so you'll be alerted anytime I put up a new video. So if you've been following along and watching the other trumpet lessons in this series, You'll notice that each trumpet lesson said you could gain a half step in range in one week. But if you listen carefully at the beginning of this video, I told you you could gain an amazing one whole step in one week. You didn't miss here, and I wasn't fooling around. This particular trumpet lesson is going to focus on technique. Yes, a lot of brute strength is required to play skillfully in the upper register on the trumpet or any brass instrument. However, you cannot forget about technique. Technique is essential. Unfortunately, so many people are using the wrong technique to play and excel in the upper register of the trumpet or any brass instrument. Okay, I can hear you say, Kurt, get on with this. What is this amazing technique you keep referring to that will give me one whole step in one week? Okay, you ready for the technique? You ready? Are you ready? The technique I'm going to share with you right now is called lip roll-in. Roll-in. R-O-L-L-I-N. Lip roll-in. And it really amazes me how many people don't know about this and how many people don't do it. And for those who know about it, they still don't do it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone on YouTube to see people start their playing and not roll in. And it looks something like this. The lips are just like this. Your horn comes up like this. And that's it. There's no rolling. So if I'm going to play in the upper register, it's going to go something like this. And what you just heard right now sounded like total crap. Why? No roll in. But you heard at the beginning of this trumpet lesson video, I killed it on Sesame Street. Do you look like this when you play in the upper register of the trumpet? Watch the lips carefully. Let 
me actually roll in and show you the difference so you can hear it and see it. Want to see it again? Now, let me go ahead and apply that technique of rolling to playing the horn. Remember, this could be applied to tuba, trombone, French horn, baritone, euphonium, cornet, flugelhorn, E flat cornet. I put the mouthpiece up to my lips. If I'm gonna play low, I'm gonna keep a low C setting, what I call a low C setting. It could be a low B flat setting if you're playing a bass clef instrument. A low C setting. Jaws drop down low. More of a pooch in your lips. Not much roll in. Oh, it kind of look, probably looks like that in the mouthpiece. Oh, lips apart, teeth apart. With a roll in, a couple of things have to accompany this particular technique. The jaw needs to be up, not, not down like in the low C. Up, teeth almost touching. Lips up and rolled in. Rolled in. More extreme now. Extremely rolled in. If you can master this technique, you will be able to play one whole step higher in one week. Too good to be true? Again, this is not a trumpet lesson about building strength to gain one half step in one week. It is a technique, and once you learn this technique, your range will go up one whole step. For those of you who are trying to count, that's two half steps in one week. Now here are two strategies that can help you gain this technique. Number one, use a mirror. Yes, you heard right. Practice this technique in front of a mirror. Or maybe you can borrow your mom or sister's makeup mirror. You know the little round one that flips around and one kind of magnifies and you can just set it on something? So use a mirror to see what's going on and try to shadow and mimic exactly what you saw me do in this video. You're going to roll in. Strategy number two, get with a professional trumpet instructor who can show you this technique in person or via Skype. Okay, so did you learn something today? If you did, here's a reminder again to subscribe to this channel. There's a lot of amazing content and actionable material that you can use starting right today. Now I want to turn it over to you. Are you going to use this amazing trumpet lesson technique to skyrocket your range in one week? Well, we're waiting. If you're going to try this technique, could you let us know in the comment section below? And what would really be appreciated would be after one week of trying this technique, how did it go? Let everybody know in the comment section. You're just going to be helping other trumpet players and brass musicians when you do that. Again, leave a comment. This has been Kurt Thompson along with TrumpetSizzle.com. And by the way, if you want amazing tutorials, exercises, practice devices, and practice aids to help make you a better musician, a better brass musician, a better trumpet player, then you need to go to TrumpetSizzle.com. And the last word, at the end of this video, you're going to see my top rated trumpet lesson video on the top two reasons why you can't play high at the end of this video. Go ahead and click on it. It's one of the number one rated trumpet lesson videos on YouTube and you watch that video and you'll see why. You're going to learn something. This has been Trumpet Lesson 3, or the third installment in the series on how to play your trumpet higher in one week. By moi, Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one, my friend. ...on the trumpet in one week. The trumpet technique that I'm going to show you today has really helped me improve my range, actually more than a half step. But we're going to let you guys experience the half step increase in range in high notes on your trumpet by using this one amazing technique.
And thanks to this one amazing technique that I'm going to show you today, I am able to play extremely well in the upper register of the trumpet. Now let me give you this warning. We're not going to be going over the same old, same old that you already know about. Lip slurs. Okay, let me try some high notes here. Slurs. Long tones. Okay. Right. Okay, now I can play high. Just did a bunch of long tones. can't play high, you've been doing long tones. So yeah, this is a warning. You're not going to get that same old advice that you've already been given, long tones and lip slurs. It can only take you so far. You are going to get an amazing, unique technique. I'm Kurt Thompson, TrumpetZizzle.com. Let's dive into it right now. So are you one of those trumpet players that want to play higher? Yeah, me too. You're going to love this technique. I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and maybe the ugly of this technique. It's so simple. You're going to be doing Roy Stevens no pressure system palming. Make your hand like this. Not like this. Not like that. Like this. Give me a high five. Your hand stiff and flat. Now I want you to turn it over. This is my left hand. You're going to turn it over. You're going to make it like a shelf. Almost like a shelf. You know, like you could set something on. See? It's a shelf. You can set a mouthpiece on there, see? Just like a shelf. Take your horn, put it on that shelf. Do not allow your fingers to do this. Even a little bit. Your hands and fingers need to be stiff and straight, almost like popsicle stick. Lay the horn on your hand. Don't grab onto it, just lay it on like a shelf. If you're not careful, it could actually fall off. That's how you want to do it. It's just like a shelf. Here we go. I want you to put it up to your lips. Now, here's parallel. You can have a little angle on it, which will help seal the vibration. This is parallel, approximately. Here's an angle. Put it up where you normally would play and play a little C. Easy, right? Yeah. Step two in how to play harder on your trumpet for this one week technique on your palm again, and I want you to play two notes. So far, so good, right? Yeah. Seems like we have an echo in this room. Step three, you're gonna add a note. So, so far we've done the low C on trumpet. We did the low C to the G on trumpet. Now we're gonna add a third note, the C. This has to be slurred, and it has to be about mezzo forte to forte, which means medium loud to loud. Remember, hands like a shelf. Lay the trumpet on the shelf. Parallel, you can add an angle to it. You want to play as high as you possibly can. Now, you're going to keep adding notes until you can't play anymore. Let's add a note. Now we'll be going to E. You think you can go up to an E? It's not that hard, is it? Do you think that you can go to an E? It's not that high, right? Yeah. Shelf. Horn.
Did you notice something? Each time I start down on the low C, we went low C, low C, G, low C, G, C, low C, G, C, E. Each time that you repeat it, you always start back on the low C. Getting to that high B flat is going to be quite an advanced move for most of you, but some of you may be able to get it. That was high C doing the Roy Stevens palming no pressure system. If you can get up to high C like that and it was loud, you really have strong chops. You really have strong chops. Yeah. You want a half step increase in your range? Seven days, my friends. Seven. Seven days. Every day. Pretty cool, huh? So now I want to turn it over to you. So did you learn something? Are you actually going to try this technique? Are you actually going to try it for seven days? If so, let me know in the comment section. Love to hear from you. Especially if you tried it for seven days and you got that high range happening. The last word, if you want exclusive tutorials, lessons, and strategies that you can only get here, you gotta go to TrumpetSizzle.com. I have something that's gonna help you get better. Tutorials, lessons, DVDs, practice aids, practice devices, exercises. I'll see you in the next one. go on to some demonstration with some of the other instruments. What if you don't play trumpet? What if you play French horn? So for French horn, I'm going to hold it like this. Let me kind of back up a little bit. I'm going to hold it like this and just, you can see how I'm holding it with my hands, just palming it. All right, let's see what we can do with trombone. your phoneme and I got one hand down here and I'm not going to grip it and um, actually this is a baritone and I got the other hand like this so I'm not gripping anything like that I'm not able to pull it in and I'm just going to start um, on a lower note guy you're probably going to have to get a little bit more um, innovative with um, is this is too heavy what is it like 25 pounds almost just to try to do what I did with the baritone which was pretty light um, if you could fashion a way to hang it or with a little bit of rope from some somewhere in your house uh, that would be great if you have a tuba stand um, I'm going to just maybe try to wing it and do it on my chair um, let's just see what happens um, so I'm on a chair here and let's just see if I can just work it up just to show you that this can be done. So it's on the chair. I've got it lean like this and I'm just going to keep it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to put my hands up here. So I'm really not going to use any pressure. Are the wheels turning right now? 
So this would actually be better if you had a tuba stand and you just bring your mouth up to it and don't even touch it. But you could see that I was using no pressure just with the tips of my fingers. If I had to choose one thing to really explode my progress on any brass instrument, especially during this time where we're all kind of stuck at home, you're not at school, you're not in your rehearsals, you're not in your ensembles, I have one thing that I would recommend that you could do right now. The sizzle pull. The sizzle pull. is the logical evolution of the peat. For many of you that have, let me get out of the way so you can really see it clearly. There we go, should, should come into focus a little bit better. For many of you who have the peat, this is the evolution of the peat. It does everything that the peat does and a lot more. It's like the peat on steroids. It has another, what, 10, 15, 20 um, variations that you can use. It's solid metal. It has some cushion beads on it, not to tear up the inside of your mouth. This is the sizzle pull. You can get this along with a tutorial for it. If you didn't want to embark on the best, number one rated Amateur Improvement Program in the world, which is my 16-week Brass Upper Register course, the new revised one, if you're not ready to take on that and tackle that, which actually that's the one that you should really be doing. But if you just wanted to try something that's easy, not going to take a lot of time, but will give you almost instant results over anything else that you could try. I mean, I've looked at everything that is out there, anything that you can buy anywhere, this will do it. The sizzle pull. This is a pull. Today, you are going to learn how to play one half step higher on the trumpet in one week. This is a trumpet lesson on how to play higher notes on the trumpet. The trumpet technique that I'm going to show you today has really helped me improve my range, actually more than a half step, but we're going to let you guys experience the half step increase in range in high notes on your trumpet by using this one amazing technique. And thanks to this one amazing technique that I'm going to show you today, I am able to play extremely well in the upper register of the trumpet. Now I should warn you, I'm not going to be giving you generic, same old advice that you've heard time and time again, maybe even here on YouTube, definitely if you're a music major, of practicing long tones, practicing the Schlossberg, blah, 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 you already know that, so I'm not going to be talking about that here. I'm going to be giving you this amazing technique that will work in seven days. You probably already know who I am, but for those of you just watching me for the first time, I'm Kurt Thompson of TrumpetSizzle.com. Let's dive right in to this amazing technique. You know, a long time ago, I was like you, struggling to increase my range, my accuracy, my power, and the real biggie 
the endurance, the ability to last an entire rehearsal or performance. And yes, some of it does work. You know, I tried the long tone thing. In fact, I still play long tones. I still do that. But not as a way to really jack up my range. I mean, I tried that. I had trumpet teachers that told me to lip buzz and mouthpiece buzz 45 minutes a day before I even touched the horn. I tried all that stuff. I didn't really get much out of it, folks. And we're just a few days away from St. Patty's Day. So why not tilt the odds in our favor? I got all green on because this is my lucky day. But it's going to be even your luckier day when you get this extra half step in range in one week. This is not a joke. This is the real deal for improving higher notes on your trumpet in just one week. This is quite cool. You just have to do it. All right, here we go. First, you are going to be taking the trumpet mouthpiece and placing it in the center of your chops the way you normally would. You're going to start off on a relatively easy note. Say, for example, middle C. Now watch carefully. I'm going to repeat middle C going to my left, and this will probably be your right but I'm going to repeat it several times as I slide the mouthpiece across my chops to my left corner. That's probably your right. Watch. Now bring it back to center and go to the other direction. This way. Crazy, right? Crazy like a fox. Now let's try going up to D. Right in the center, over. Bring it back to the center and head the other direction. Wow! You're probably saying, hey Kurt, what's so amazing about that? You are adding a different stress and a different placement on the chops that you're not used to doing. It's going to throw you for a little bit of a loop. And then watch the range start to happen, my friend. So we did C, we did D, and you want to keep going as high as you can until you're no longer able to go across each direction. Let's fast forward. Let's pretend I'm trying to do this on a G above the staff, which is getting pretty high for this technique. Center. Over. Getting tough. Back center. We're going to go this direction. There we go. What? No. You didn't ask me right now to try this on a high C. It's a crazy, amazing, wild, quirky technique, but on a high C? Huh? What? Ah, uh, what the F. You want to hear it on a high C? It's going to sound ho horrible. It's going to sound god awful. Let's try it. center and to the other way. Woo! It was the green hat. The green. The look of the Irish. The reason I was able to do this on high C. Now, this technique is an amazing technique and you will get one half step in one week on your trumpet. This has been a trumpet lesson on how to play higher on trumpet. And actually, it will work for trombone, tuba, French horn, euphonium, baritone. Now, will this amazing, powerful trumpet technique allow you to do this?
Maybe not, maybe so. But you will get the one half step increase in your range on trumpet or any brass instrument. I promise you that in one week. So after going through this one amazing technique with me and having observed how to do it, did you learn something new today? Are you going to try this technique? Why wouldn't you try this technique? Well anyway, if you did learn something new today, make sure to subscribe to my channel, Trumpet Sizzle. It's easy. Just click on that rectangular red button that says subscribe below, right below. Maybe it's right there. It's right there. Just click on it and you'll be automatically subscribed. I'd also hit that bell notification. That way, every time I upload something you might be interested in, you'll get a notification of it right away. And by the way, if you want exclusive training, courses, tutorials, practice aids, exercises, all for brass players, trumpet, tuba, euphonium, baritone, French horn, cornet, flugelhorn, then head on over to trumpetsizzle.com. TrumpetSizzle.com Now, I would like to turn it over to you. Are you going to try this amazing, powerful technique to jack your range up in one week? One half step? Either way, let me know by leaving a comment below right now. This has been a trumpet lesson video on how to play higher notes on the trumpet, specifically on how to gain one half step in range in one week. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, middle C, high C, and double C buzz. And that's the ultimate test in pure embouchure and lip strength. Notice I was doing the real lip buzz. I wasn't doing the little puff out your thing that eighth graders do. No, I was doing the real lip buzz with an embouchure set, my lips rolled in, like I'm blowing into the horn. So make sure you're comparing apples to apples. What I did was the real lip buzz, free lip buzzing, like you got your armature set. So if you do this, that doesn't, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real free lip buzzing, which requires an enormous amount of armature strength. And you can always just about count on the fact that if you can buzz a certain note, it's likely you can play about an octave higher than that. Buzz a high C, you can probably play double C. Buzz a middle C, you can probably play high C. Buzz a double C, like I just did, you can probably play a triple C, which is true. So there is a correlation between your lip buzz and your strength and what you do on the trumpet, what you do on any other brasses, where it doesn't really matter, tuba, trombone, whatever. So um, embouchure strength is the most important thing the most important aspect of um, brass playing. Take it away and you really have little left. Little left. You might as well just become a singer. I mean, you really do. If you don't have the embouchure strength, you, you can't play, uh, I don't know, maybe you can play um, in, your, in the low register and that's about all you're going to get if you absolutely have no strength here whatsoever. Um, nothing really is going to happen on the horn. You could, you could be an um, Olympic swimmer with great lungs and air. Um, no embouchure strength that is going nowhere. So that, there you have it. And I will continue on um, with this brass improvement series right here. Hey, today we're going to be talking about chop strength or embouchure strength versus air. And um, it seems like every other day I'm getting an email from somebody um, with a counter point of view of, um, for myself about air. A lot of times you hear me say um, air is not the main thing that's going to get you your range. 
and it's not the only thing. And then people think that um, I, don't, I don't believe in air at all, and that's not true. Um, but we really need to figure things out. If Now, I love Don Jacoby and his stuff. Bill Adams is wonderful. In fact, um, I do a little bit of his stuff in my four-month upper register program, the lead pipe buzzing and stuff like that. So, And then the other yoga breathing techniques. But air, my friend, if you work only on air and think that's the holy grail to ultimate endurance and upper register, you're going to fail. That's just the bottom line. And we're going to find out why today. In fact, I'm going to prove that air is not the holy grail to upper register. It really is lip and embouchure strength. And then the second to that would be how you compress your air. So that is a very important part of being in upper register and playing that way, um, playing clearly in the upper register. So, um, and I'm not following a script here. I'm just thinking out loud, but um, you need to see a good up close demonstration. That's why I have this camera so close. I want you to notice um, how much air I'm really taking in to be able to get in the upper register. And if you have half a brain, you're going to figure things out that um, you got to have the chop strength. You got to have the lip strength. Lip strength is a little different than your embouchure. I mean, than the muscles that surround here. Don't believe me? Watch some autopsies. It's pretty gruesome. But you're going to see that the musculature of the face right through here. Our embouchure actually is different tissue than what you have right here. And so this is a little something different here that we want to work on to get stronger. You have to have lip strength to withstand the pressure of the air coming out. So yes, you do need to be able to have um, great air flow and to be able to really compress the air. That's the most important part. So even if you only had one lung, if you had the mechanism set up to really compress that air and everything was synced and coordinated, I'm sure that you could probably still play decently in the upper register and, and expand your range. I'm confident of that. And let's find out why that is. So uh, I'm going to put the mouthpiece up. First of all, I'm going to see if you can get the feeling of when I take a full breath. So here's the full breath. <sighs> okay, so you'll know when I'm taking a full breath. I'm sitting down, so you'll see that I have to do that. Now, if I take a partial breath, I'm, I'm not going to take a full breath. And by the way, this, is, this video is... Um, in lieu of me writing out a big email for my brass um, techniques improvement series I'm just basically it's going to be this video so you're not going to see a long email this is the next installment in the brass players improvement um, email series I do on Facebook so i am just be watching this and take notes so uh, check this out and I'm going to try to make it clear when I do take a larger breath so you need to see my lips try to get it close I'm putting the mouthpiece up. I'm going to take about 20% air. Here we go. That's it. That's only 20%, folks. Now, I didn't exactly have the accuracy that I wanted because I didn't have the airstream pushing it forward. But that's pure embouchure strength. Let's do it again. I'm going to take about the same amount of air, about 20%. Here we go. It's only 20 I think I got up maybe around the triple F range, give or take. Um, wasn't a lot of air there. Now, I will put in a lot of a lot more air. So let me take in um, double that. Let's go up to about fifty percent. That's about fifty. So I'm getting more sound out, and the air um, that I'm blowing through my chops is more air more quantity and it's actually a, probably a little bit faster of course now because i'm blowing more air that's activating um, all the muscle contraction in here it's got to still um, stay sealed on the mouthpiece otherwise the lips would fly up and you're not going to be able to, to um, go up any higher so anyway that should be really clear let's just take another look at that um, not much air so here we go that's a big breath and let me let it all out Basically, you saw me playing a double G, that's a double concert F, on the trumpet with 
virtually no air. Did, did anybody check that out? I basically had hardly any air. And how loud was it? It came out about MF. So wait a minute. Now let's go back to Don Jacoby. And um, we can even include Stamps and uh, some of these other guys, um, Bill Adams, uh, real big proponents. Even my hero, Bud Brisboy, real big proponent of um, his wedge breath. He was the he was the original wedge breath guy. Um, shoe came after him. Bud Boy, Bud Brisboy is the original, the originator of um, wedge breath breathing. In case you guys didn't know that, and there's actually two versions. The shoe version, Bobby Shoes, is a little bit different more applicable to like real-time playing but Bud Bruce boy uh, basically said his way of um, breathing this wedge breath was the reason he could play so high and um, um, tell you the truth that was I don't believe that's true <laughs> the guy had incredible chops and um, uh, I'm pretty confident that even if he hadn't um, only one lung or wasn't breathing as quite as good as he did in the wedge breath um, that he originated, he could still play very, very well in the upper register. He had a natural setup, and so I think he was trying to explain why he could play so well. Sometimes when players are born with natural leverage and a natural ability to really compress air, they're not quite exactly sure what they're doing. So they, they look to rationalize how they're able to do it. You can watch Maynard. Um, one of the, the ultimate um, talent in upper register. His just look at his face. He had the nat he had a natural setup. His teeth and everything was just perfect for being able to get the high velocity out um, to play in the upper register. Now, of course, he had to work. He had to practice. You know, not shortchanging that. But I think at some point he was trying to figure out how he was actually doing it. He had just this ultimate talent. I mean, he had the perfect leverage just built into a system that a lot of us have to work a lot harder to get. <laughs> And sometimes we don't even get, um, you know, get to that level. So uh, he, you can watch in some of his master classes that he really explains um, about his, that he worked a lot on his breathing. And then he leans back. He's really big about bending knees and leaning back. And I'm going to tell you something. And uh, Maynard is also one of my heroes, just along with Bud. But they're trying to explain how they're able to play so easily and well that upper register when, in fact, they had just like the ultimate amount of talent to be able to do so in natural setup. Um, I'm confident that you can take in a big gulp of air and practice yoga, lean back, bend your knees, and you're not going to be sounding like Maynard. And you're not going to really get that much upper register. You're going to have to do something to strengthen this um, area up here in your face. You have to have the strength up here. There's just no question. And um, what do um, a lot of people tell you to do? Do long tones, take stuff up an take stuff up an octave, play in the upper register, and really work on your airflow, and you'll get there. Uh, nope, <laughs> it doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. Now, it might for some people, some people who are already predisposed and have the natural great leverage in their in their face right here, their tongue. Maybe they got a small. If you have a smaller oral cavity and you're using your tongue arch, you really can speed up there a lot faster. So um, th and there's a lot of things that really go into this to making um, natural leverage. So yes, the people that have gained a lot of range and can excel very well in the upper and extreme upper reg register of any brass instrument, if they did the long tones, if they really worked on their breathing, if they played stuff up an octave, they might actually just get um, to where they wanted to be, where everybody wants to be but mainly because they had already a predisposition, predisposition for natural leverage and, um, and a great um, um, compression ability just through their genetics. So um, the rest of us, uh, you're going to have to really be strategic about getting this strength. And unfortunately for most of us, not one method and not one technique is going to get you there. In other words, uh, you can't just do Bill Adams method and get there. It's going to work for some people, but will it work for you or me? I don't know. Um, Claude Gordon, love it. And I actually got something out of it, but is it going to work for you? I've, I've been teaching for a long time, and that Claude Gordon doesn't work for everybody. It works for me, and uh, not ultimately, but you know, it did help me out at one point. So I love the Claude Gordon stuff. Uh, Roy Stevens. So... Uh, palming and all that kind of stuff. Will it work for you? It may. 
and it may not. Reinhardt, all these other methods that are out there, Cat Anderson is the, probably the, the toughest method to actually go through. So there's a whole bunch out there. Uh, the only question is, will it work for you? And those methods are successful for some people, but not for everybody. Of course, we already know why it's not successful for everybody. It's just fact. If one method was actually successful at producing um, gorgeous high notes and upper register abilities and endurance, then we would all only use that one method. Think about it. Let's use our brain here. If one method was that successful, we, you wouldn't be listening to this right now, and I wouldn't be talking about it. Everybody could just do it. So the fact of the matter is not one method is perfect for everybody. As a result, that's the whole nature of my four-month upper register course. Uh, there are 65 techniques, and these techniques come from um, every method you can think of. The bulk of it are actually my techniques, and I include a lot of breathing for compression and some other stuff. So you have to um, take the macro approach to really build in the strength. We don't know which one, which particular technique is going to do it for you. I'm confident that um, out of 65, 5 or 10 are definitely going to be the magic bullet for you. But what's the magic bullet for you? Don't know. And whatever it is, it won't be the same for me or the same for the next guy or gal. So you really have to use your intelligence here if you want to improve your upper register. And keep in mind, the I don't care what instrument you play. I don't care if you're a college professor or you're a comeback player or um, you're a hobbyist, or you're a pro player, whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters is you have to keep improving your range. You can't be sub subtle on your range, wherever it is at today, because the more range you have, what happens, even if you don't want to play double Cs, um, classical guys out there, if you can play a double C, what happens here? Boom, the pressure comes off your lips when you're playing in the, in the uh, Tessa Tour that you normally play in, whether it's middle C up to maybe E's. So you don't, you don't have to um, have the desire to play double Cs. It's just if you can play them in your practice, the pressure comes off here. You get a better sound, a bigger sound, and a lot more endurance. So let's take one more look, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Really, the air is important. And to compress the air, you really have to arch the tongue in your mouth up, like you're saying N or E or T. Your tongue's actually like this that it's doing the arch like that and you're blowing the air from the back of your throat up and over the tongue and it comes out the aperture now that's great we got to have that air but if you don't have the super strong embouchure chops in the lip able to contract and hold that air into the mouthpiece all the air in the, is just going to be useless for you and that's um, this brass improvement email series. Hope you get a lot out of it. You're seeing a real good close up of me, maybe too close. Let's take another look at the mouthpiece. So I'm putting the mouthpiece right on my chops and take a small amount of air. Okay, not a whole lot of pressure there, really. And that was probably about 30% of my air capacity. That should prove a point. It should really prove a point that, yes, work on your air, but you need to focus a lot more on how to get this going here. And let me just leave you with this. If you're pounding away and banging your head at one method, and you keep wondering why it doesn't work, but you know it should work because it works for everybody else, well, that's um, erroneous thinking right there. You really need to take the shotgun approach. I'm here to tell you, you gotta take the shotgun approach, the macro point of view. Uh, when it comes to really increasing your strength in your face, your lips, and everything else. you just got to do it. Otherwise, you're going to be one of those guys that um, sticks with a method um, because you don't want to, um, I guess, admit that you've made the wrong decision. You'll stick with that me method for all your life, and you'll always have problems in the upper register. So use your intelligence. Think about things in an intelligent way. And I'm Kurt Thompson. Hope this made a little sense to you. And today's date, by the way, happens to be March 7th, 2013. Take care.
about trumpet high notes, trumpet lessons, and trumpet mouthpieces. Now, a lot of people think that if you can play high, it's because you're playing on a shallow mouthpiece. In fact, a lot of people that are unable to play high, when they hear someone play high, will say that they're using a, a cheater mouthpiece or a shallow mouthpiece to be able to get those notes. That's not necessarily so. There's the right tool for the job. So what I wanted to point out today, I want to dispel a couple of myths. Um, I do happen to play on a shallower mouthpiece. It is a Neil Sander 17S. Um, but is this the only reason why I'm able to play high? Is it the only reason why other trumpet players who are um, quite adept in the upper register of the trumpet, their mouthpiece, is it, is it the only reason why they can play high? I don't think so. I think that you have to practice the right techniques in the right way for the right amount of time to be able to get your upper register the way you want it. Now, I wanted to go through a couple of mouthpieces that are quite common. Uh, let's pull out, this is the Bach 1.5C. I'll see if I can get it up there in the, in the camera for you. So you know that I'm really showing you the real deal. I uh, probably can't really see it. Let's see if I can turn it a little bit. There we go. Take my word for it. That's a Bach 1.5C. Now it's a little bit cold. Now, according to a lot of people who can't play high, I shouldn't be able to hit a double C on this one. Now I will tell you that the mouthpiece I play on, I play on it for a reason. I like the sound I get, I like the tone, I like the accuracy, I like the volume I get out of it. Uh, otherwise I could just play on any mouthpiece, right? So this one here will probably not sound as good to me and have the projection and some of the other qualities that I love in my Neil Sanders, but will I be able to play a double C on this one like I do on mine? If the people who can't play high that put out this myth that, that um, you can only play high with a cheater mouthpiece are right, then I should not be able to play much maybe beyond a high C on this one. So let's find out. This is a Bach uh, one and a quarter, I'm sorry, Bach one and a half C. Now I'll just play a middle C here. No problems there. Does seem a little bit harder than mine. Whoa, wait a minute. That was a double C. It was on a Bach one and a half C mouthpiece. Well, it looks like I just broke that myth that you have to be able to use a cheater mouthpiece to be able to play high. Now there's a lot of people that play on this one, a lot of symphonic players um, that uh, poo poo high notes. So they play on this one. Uh, they don't really have to play much more than a high C or a high D in their symphonic and orchestral works, even the professional trumpet players I'm talking about in major symphony orchestras. This is one of their favorite mouthpieces right here. Um, when I use this on a regular job or a gig for um, playing Maynard stuff, um, playing lead, no, I wouldn't, because um, this makes life more difficult. But, you heard it right here, folks. I played a double C on this Bach one and a half mouthpiece. Let's see if I can show you it again. Well, before I put this away, I got a couple other ones to show you. Let me put you. Let me put it right back in. This is the Bach one and a half C mouthpiece. I'll put it right back in my horn. Let's just see if that was a fluke. Maybe it's a one-time fluke and I won't be able to get it again. No, if it wasn't a fluke, I am able to play high on a Bach one and a half mouthpiece. Let's set that one aside. Now. What is the most common trumpet mouthpiece in all the world? If you answered a 7C, you are correct. I'm going to see what happens when we get out the 7C. Now watch this video carefully because this is all uncut. There's the 7C. Can everybody see it? I'm going to leave it in the video. I'm coming back around. 
Coming back around, there's no cutting or editing. Here's the box 7C. This is what you get typically when you buy a new horn. Typically what beginners play on it. Very few professionals play on a 7C. There might be one out of a thousand that would play on a 7C. Well, let me try it. Now, supposedly, um, I shouldn't be able to play on high on this one either, right? It's a 7C mouthpiece, not a cheater mouthpiece, not a lead mouthpiece. Let's see what happens. Now, if you watch the video, I've been going on continuously there, so there's been no monkey business. It's still on my horn. on this 7C mouthpiece. Shouldn't be able to do that, should I? According to the people who can't play high and who use typically the larger mouthpieces, I shouldn't be able to play high on that, should I? Okay, so I played on a Bach 1.5C, played a double C. I played on a Bach 7C, played a double C. <laughs> Let's get out just a couple more. This one here it, this is a Bach 10.5C. Now this is the mouthpiece that a lot of classical players uh, who really can't play high will, will actually use in their piccolo. Let's see if I can show it to you. Sorry. It's not coming in clear. There you go. You can see it's there. That's the Bach 10.5C. I'll leave it in the frame so you can see me put it right on my horn. This is the one that a lot of classical players, professional, principal, symphonic players all across the country, the major metropolitan um, symphony orchestras, will pop this and when they got to play something high, or they'll put it in their piccolo, and then they go back to their one and a half C. They'll put the box two and a half C in. It's cold. Let me warm it up. Middle C. High C. Double C. I'm going to pull right on my horn. You saw exactly what I was playing on. This is no trick photography here. It's a Bach 10 and a half C. Oh, what is this? This is a Bach 12. Bach 12 C. We'll try that one. I've actually never played on a 12 C before. I borrowed a couple of these mouthpieces just for this demonstration. About 12C, I have no idea how I'd play this one. It is probably a little bit more smaller than the 10 and a half C, I'm guessing. what I'm going to get on this thing. You can see it's a huge, huge, deep, 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 deep cup. French horn mouthpiece. What, what is it here? It's 11. It's a Vincent Bach 11. French horn mouthpiece. So I still have it here. Let me put it in my horn. Of course you know it won't fit properly. But it's in there. Let's just see what I can get with this. It's not going to sound pretty. It's going to be out of tune probably swim around. But it's a French horn mouthpiece. Um, I really shouldn't be able to play too high on it. Most French horn players can't play too high, so let's see what will happen. <laughs> Definitely a different tone. A lot warmer. I see now. Real muffled. It's probably going to be very difficult to get the double C out. You heard it right there. Got a double C on a French horn mouthpiece in my trumpet. So, let's go back to my mouthpiece. Neil Sanders 17S. There you go, you can kind of see it there. There we go. Neil Sanders. You can tell it's beat up. This is the very mouthpiece that I played Gabriel, Gabriel Maynard Ferguson's Gabriel on. Uh, quite a number of years ago. So if you happen to see my video doing that one, um, 
or hear it somewhere. This is the same mouthpiece I used for that one. Now let's go back. You're going to notice that I can, of course, still play the high note. It's just going to have more of a punch, more power. That's your middle C. Here's your high C. Love it, love it the way it comes out. You notice that all in all these mouthpieces, I was able to hit the double C. All of us have different dental structure, different facial features up here. And therefore, what, what works for somebody, for example, this works for me, might not work for you. And that's why I would definitely recommend, and I recommend all my students to spend some time going through different mouthpieces and making sure that mouthpiece is uh, appropriate for what you do. This mouthpiece may not be the perfect mouthpiece for a symphonic player, but it shouldn't be the reason a symphonic player would say that they can't play high because they need a cheater mouthpiece. I've just broken that myth right here. You heard me play a double C on a Bach one and a half mouthpiece. You've heard me play, that's a one and a half C mouthpiece. You heard me play a double C on a Bach seven C mouthpiece. That's the standard mouthpiece that every little kid gets uh, when they take their horn right out of the case for the first time. So what can we learn from this? You, first of all, need to be taking lessons from someone like myself. or some You gotta take lessons from somebody who already can do what you wanna do. That's number one. Number two, put the notion of mouthpieces allowing you to play high out of your head and actually do the real trumpet work. What does that mean? You actually got to practice. And you got to practice the right stuff in the right amounts. That's what we learned today. You don't need a cheater mouthpiece to play high. You should be able to play high on any mouthpiece you pick up. I just proved it here. You know, I want you to go to trumpetsizzle.com. That's www.trumpetsizzle.com. I have an array of uh, trumpet video lessons. Um, my main job is teaching trumpet from beginners all the way up to advanced and professionals. Yes, I do have a couple of professionals from time to time that come in that want to learn how to improve their range. Always remember, it takes about 5,000 hours of concentrated practice from beginning, whether you started in fifth grade or if you're starting as an adult. Doesn't matter, log those hours in. It takes about 5,000 hours just to reach the very bottom of the professional caliber trumpet player. So if you're wondering where you're at or why you're not where you want to be, think about how many hours you've logged in since you began playing. And if it's not 5,000, chances are you need to put in some more practice time. And I'll repeat it again, you got to get with the right teacher. In fact, let me just bring that up before we close it. You know, if you go to Google and you type in trumpet lessons, you're going to see uh, quite a variety of people on there, including myself. I come on page two right now, I'm trying to get on page one. But you want to get with a trumpet instructor who not only can tell you how to play high, show you how to play high, but actually has been out there in front of an audience with different bands playing uh, upper register trumpet music. Anyway, what I've noticed is that a lot of these trumpet players that you know, you're going to find that pop up on Google on page one right away, uh, if you try to search their name and find out what they've done, what they've played, um, some of them you can't even find a live video of them playing. But their, their marketing is really good. So I would just caution you that as you're looking for somebody to help you out with your um, trumpet lessons and improving high range and everything else, you want to get for, with somebody who can actually play the trumpet, play the way you want to play, and has actually proved it with bands and other live audiences. Go to trumpetsizzle.com. See you there.
cannot play high. Well, I just demonstrated one of them. This. This. The meat. The muscle. Right? But you already knew that, right? Yeah. You know you got to have chops. You got to build this. Everything. All these muscles, everything. It's all got to be built up strong. So you know that one, but maybe you didn't. Uh, maybe you thought it was talent. Okay. A lot of people think it's just talent. Can't play high. I was just born to play third chair. Just the way it is. Don't get mad about it. Don't beat yourself up over it. You just weren't born with the talent to be able to play high. Uh, actually, some people feel that way. But that is 100% wrong. 100% incorrect. That's your belief system, but it's not reality. Your belief system, but not reality. So the top reason that you can't play high is you haven't gone through the process of training this and the whole mechanism from diaphragm to here to here to out to the horn. You haven't gone through that process. Now you can look at vi uh, video, YouTube after YouTube. In fact, I just crossed over the 600 mark on my YouTube channel. Uh, videos available to the public. You can watch them all. You're not going to get that miraculous improvement in range and endurance just by watching videos, even though I'm giving you some good advice and others are giving you good advice, you have to go through the process. The process is systematically applying so many different angles at your chops, your breathing, your tongue, strategically over a period of time infused with momentum. That's what the process is. And um, you're not likely to have gone through that process if you're watching this video. Or maybe you're just watching it just for giggles. But um, you have to go through the process. It seems like a lot of teachers that can actually play decently high are not taking their students through the process. And um, as a result, the students don't end up playing as well as the teacher. And they don't even make that much improvement. It's about the process, not about one or two techniques or a routine that you're going to do. It's about the process. <clears throat> so, if you watch my stuff, you will get better, and you are certainly going to play a little bit higher, a little bit better, a bigger sound, a bigger tone, um, more accuracy, better endurance, yes, but you're not going to get that miracle, amazing, oh my god, I was playing high C's and D's a few months ago, and now I'm zinging out double high G's, now I can actually do some Broadway shows if I wanted. No, you're not going to get that by watching just um, individual random videos on how to play trumpet better from anybody. You have to go through the process. I happen to know what that process is, by the way. And um, according to most of the people that have been working with me, it seems like they know it now too and they can demonstrate it. So let's go on to number two, or the second reason, the second top reason that you can't play high. At the, that. That. Tongue and tongue arch. Now, you can still play high without the tongue arch. <coughs> I'm going to play high right now, leaving my tongue dropped in a low C positioning. And now it's not going to sound good at all. to still get up there even though it sucked I had the chops but having the chops is one part of the equation if you don't have the tongue arch my friend you can have the range F G <laughs> weak kind of brittle sounding stiff sounding not that powerful but I can get those notes that proves to you right there that if you're still not doing some things right, that you can still gain some altitude 
just by developing your chops, but that's not going to um, be the panacea and what you're thinking about as an end result of how you want to play. So the tongue arch, <coughs> the less space you have in your mouth when the air is coming out, you're going to zing out higher notes because the air is going to be speeding past the lips, vibrating them faster, vibrating the air that goes into here, coming out here, it's going to all be faster. Okay. So how do we do that? It's the tongue arch. And it's kind of one of the most elusive techniques on the trumpet. It really is. I, I get people that can actually play pretty decently um, up to high C, D, even E. And um, they're not using tongue arch, but they're so used to not using tongue arch that they can actually play sometimes at the professional level or as a professional in a symphony. It's quite amazing how they can do that. They're making things in life very, very hard by doing that, but yet they've accommodated not being able, not knowing about the tongue arch or not being able to do it. <coughs> so what if you had a screwed up embouchure, or what if you thought you didn't play correctly? Well, here's my natural setting. What if I played poorly? Let's move the mouthpiece over a little bit. There we go, see it? I'm way off my amateur, in fact, I'm over. What about the other way? Well, now I'm back to center. Move it over. Now I'm really playing not where I want to play. I can still do it, but it sucked that on that one side compared to the other. So I've, I've showed you that with no tongue arch, I can still play high. Playing on a totally screwed up embouchure, one side to the other like that, I can still play some, you know, actually into the upper register above high C. So it's the tongue arch. Tongue arch. So quit looking at whether or not you got a bad embouchure, a defective embouchure, whether or not um, you think that you're playing a little off center and your teacher's on you for that. Or you play too high, play too low. Um, you can work on that stuff later, but that's not your problem. The problem is tongue arch, um, especially if you've got the other part handled, the, um, the musculature, the armature, and the strength. But a lot of people don't got that handled either. But it's the tongue arch. With the tongue arch, you can do quite amazing things. So if you can play... Um, high B flats, B's and C's with the perfectly executed and advanced tongue arch that those high C's automatically turn into E's and F's with no change in the musculature and the strength that you know the embouchure here. Tongue arch works wonders. <coughs> That's the second reason that you can't play the and if it's the top the second reason or it's the second place why almost all brass players can't get altitude and can't have good endurance. It seems to be mis mystical and ambiguous, foggy, murky, unclear what the tongue arch really is. But basically, if you can anchor, take the tip of your tongue, that's the tip. Take it and put it under, uh, um, behind your teeth, your lower teeth. Here's upper, lower. Take the tip, go down, and anchor it. I have the tip anchored right at the bottom of my lower teeth where the teeth kind of almost turn into the gums, you know, right at that gum line, or you run out of teeth, and you can feel the wet gum. That's where you anchor the tip of your tongue. Yeah. And then the tongue arches up. Like you're saying in. All right, E-I-N-G, swimming. Mm. Yeah. So that's when you're at maximum tongue arch, and... Here's a good test for you. Now, I made another tutorial about this, but it was kind of shorter. So <clears throat> you can try this on different things. Purpose, here's me going from second line G to C on purpose. Okay. seeing movement here I'm also adding a little extra tension when I'm going up to give it push the way to really get the feeling 
<coughs> of tongue arch, so it's not theory, it's actually something real, real that you're doing, is to purposely try not to get the top note, yet raise your tongue in an arch position. So right now, I'm going to take a big breath, and I'm going to hold a G, but during that time, what's happening inside my mouth is this. My tongue is arching up. You already know that tip is placed behind my teeth. So it's going here. Ah. Uh, up. And I'm purposely going to try not to get the C. Watch what happens. Hear that? Of course, it didn't sound good, but I'm purposely trying not to get the C. I don't want the C to come out. Watch again. Again. You notice no movement going on here at all, right? And I'm not... I'm really trying not to let the seed to come out. That's your assignment. If you can get that to happen, you've executed the tongue arch quite perfectly. Now, it doesn't stop there. The tongue has to be developed, and you have to be able to hold the tongue arch under a lot of undue pressure when you're above high C. That pressure will flatten down your tongue, and, you'll, and your range will drop. Not because you don't have chops, because you're not maintaining the tongue arch. So <clears throat> the tongue arch, is, you got to get it but then you have to develop it to withstand the pressure that will be inside your oral cavity when you're really playing in the upper register and beyond. Um, your tongue arch drops just a micromillimeter and you've lost um, two notes on your range, just like that. That's how easy it is. So watch, let's try it on a different note. Uh, low C. I'm trying to do that, right? You can tell. What if I take a big breath and purposely stay on that low C? Don't let that G come out. Take a bigger breath this time. The first one came out air because I didn't have any air left. Even low C to G, which is a wider interval, isn't it? It's a, another note wider, so you're going to fifth. Um, now, a lot more air is coming out on low C than it is on G, because you, you have the placement of your jaw and your tongue even lower. But still, you could hear that something was happening. In fact, the air started to cut off and on that first one. Did you hear that? It was almost no air. I mean, it was just air coming out. But the low C would not come out. So don't think that was a mistake. The low C would not come out anymore. Let me just see if I can go for the air again, because that was pretty important. I'm raising the tongue up to the point where the low C will not vibrate anymore. Well, now that time the note came out. No, hold on, I'm trying to, get, I'm trying to keep the low C down, but I'm raising my tongue into a tongue arch. No, it's not going to do it this time. I guess it was kind of a fluke, but still, that was important um, to realize I'm trying to play the low C, which even beginners can get. So you know something was going on inside here. I mean, if I can't play the low C, something really is as bad, as bad and it's going to, something bad is going to happen. Maybe the, the end of the world tonight. I can't play a low C. And if you can't play a low C, it's probably the same thing. Now, if I'm playing a low C and I do something inside my mouth that causes the low C not to come out, you know I'm doing something. You know something is going on. You just have to know that. So I was probably speeding up the air too fast for the low C to come out, and it was in the little twilight zone area right before the G was going to snap out. So um, I'm not even sure if I've even tried this on C to E. Now, I'm thinking that as you get more narrow in intervals, 
uh, but it's probably going to come out easier. So I'm not sure if this will be the best demonstration or not. Let's find out. <coughs> so middle C to E. Oh, nor normally. Now, without, I'm going to try to keep it at middle C and not let the E to come out. Oh, no. The, okay, it gets easier as you go higher, actually. Yeah, okay, so that's why I was experiencing that air at the low C to G. So uh, this demonstration is actually perfect for you at G to C. And if you do have range up to about an A to a high C, um, you might want to try it from middle C to E because it's actually easier. But it might be so easy that you don't really get the feeling of it. So um, you've heard me do three different ones. G to C is commonly what I show students. Um, low C to G is going to be harder. And um, C to E is going to be easier. So you've got three different um, intervals that you can slur to. Um, using the tongue arch. Remember, you're trying not to let the top note come out. You're trying not to let the top note come out. That's what you're trying to do. But you're arching up. You're trying to arch the tongue as high as it will arch. But with the goal of not getting that top note. Because if you have the goal to get the top note, then you might add a little bit more pressure here. You might blow harder. You're going to be doing some things unconsciously that you've just already trained yourself to do to get the note to come out. That's why it's important to really, it might go against your ego, but really do not let that top note come out. Just keep arching the note up and hope it doesn't come out. And when the top note does come out, if it does for you, um, then you know that you've got the tongue arch decently perfected, um, but just not strengthened. I mean, the tongue arch, you either get it or you don't, right? It's, there's not really a gray area. You got it perfected, you can do it or you don't have it at all. There's not really a middle ground. You either got it or you don't. After that point, it's about developing your tongue and the tongue, tongue arch to really be refined and just amazingly uh, versatile when you're playing. That's where I come in. Have you ever heard that I got a website called trumpetsizzle.com and that I teach a lot of people, uh, especially a lot of advanced and professional players uh, that want to get better with endurance and range? Well, if you haven't heard about it, um, you're just hearing it now. I actually do that. That's kind of actually what I'm good at. And um, I do I'm good at some other things too, but that's, I kind of have this natural knack for helping people out with that. So if you'd like to learn more, you, you can definitely look at more videos here. And if you're watching this, why not go ahead and subscribe? Uh, you can support me. You're, you're going to get an instant um, email when I put up new videos like this. And um, I don't know. I think that you're going to, learn something and become a better player but if you really want to take the horse by the reins and run run with it you got to do something and that's called going through the process which i alluded to earlier in the video so but this this tutorial on tongue arch should help you and now if you're not getting the note to come out at all even though you're trying not to it doesn't come out um, that's where again you need a coach you need someone to work with you on that because that is the second reason you're not able to play high play with power of the upper register or even have great endurance if you're constantly playing a low c position in the upper register you're gassing out all the muscles here you're just putting such a load on them and that's why you don't have any endurance so you might even have a little range where you have no endurance you got to get the tongue arch. It's the second reason people have problems in the upper register and with endurance. Since you've already heard me say that, you might, it's a no-brainer. Work on it. Get it going. It's worth the investment in time. So, that's a wrap. Hey guys and gals. Um, I've been using a cool little trick, tip shortcut again this is not a substitute for the process or for enrolling in lessons or and specifically we're enrolling in some of my 
pedagogical specific courses like upper register, technique, the trumpet playing, breathing. But I have found that this is a very potent and quick results producing technique. And I call it the frozen lip bend. I've scoured Google, YouTube, even that crappy little site called Vimeo. Uh, no, there's, there's nobody else that has come up with this. So the date of this video will be the copyright for this particular technique. It's the frozen uh, lip bend. We could almost call it deep frozen lip bends. And so you've seen people uh, demonstrate lip, lip bends almost in a half step fashion and it, it looks impressive. They're doing things like um, Great folks, I mean, come on. <laughs> so when you see someone, a pro that's screwing around, lip bending like that, uh, that's kindergarten stuff. You want to you want to go up to the to the heavyweight league with the big boys, then you do deep, deep lip bends on any brass instrument. Not this little half step bullshit jargon that's not going to get you anything. So here we go. Um, I like to play um, the. Uh, the F sharp in the in the G progression down. So play the F sharp. Now no valve. Soft and increase dynamics. Control baby, back it off. Okay, now that is the half step lip bend that you hear all the time, except that was a deep, fro that was a frozen lip bend, not quite deep, but now it's gonna get deeper. Now let's go to something that you don't hear anybody doing unless you've watched another of my tutorials on lip bending. We're gonna go down to F natural, which is gonna be the whole step below G. to triple pianissimo baby all right this uh, this is the big boy league and uh, you might not even be able to do what I just did but that doesn't mean that you couldn't do it with a little bit of practice with trying this this takes incredible resilient flexible strong powerful chops to be able to accommodate what I'm showing you now with this technique the deep frozen lip bend Let's go even deeper. Now, you'd never hear anybody, I haven't heard anybody <laughs> lip bend down to an E in this part of the range of the horn and the trumpet. So, G, D, now we're going down a minor third. Lift the belt up. Incredible, incredible amount of control there and finesse to be able to accommodate that. Uh, you have a favorite celebrity trumpet player and you're, if you're friends with them, ask them to do what I'm doing. Uh, the odds are very considerable and stacked against them that they won't be able to do that. So well, now we're going to get into the extreme minority of all professional, actually this is not even professional, this is way above professional level playing. And you have to have worked considerably on the physical aspects of brass playing to be able to accommodate this to go down a major third and control it. So G down to E flat. Drupal piano ladies and gentlemen again quite an exhibition in resiliency malleability flexibility powerful um, what other kind of adjectives can I come up with this it's just um, you really have to have excelled 
way above the typical professional commercial or orchestral player to be able to do this. Uh, but with this technique, you can. It's not going to happen overnight. But what is going to happen is as you keep working on this, you're going to notice that your sound opens up. Your flexibility just becomes like, like, a, like a hot knife through butter as you go through all registers of the horn and the facility of the horn. It's just going to be a piece of cake. Of course, your range is going to improve. Um, I think that this would be especially good for orchestral players. Uh, because I have a feeling that you're going to be able to open up and get that more brassy resonance on the mid and lower middle register of the horn, which is where a lot of this orchestral music is played, um, especially if you're not principal trumpet. So this could be very bene beneficial if you totally don't like the commercial and jazz idiom of playing and you're more into the classical, this could really benefit you in this particular register. Uh, now. Let's go to no man's land. We're going to go down to perfect fourth. Man, this is like super deep. Uh, this is like the 12 foot um, uh, deep end of the pool where the you know the, the high dive is. So here we go. Uh, I'm close to perfect, but not. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Well, when it comes to looks, yeah, that has been pretty close. But when it comes to playing, yeah, you know, I have my problems. It's just like everybody else. So, um, uh, I guarantee you, most of you are not going to be able to do that. But you do not need to be depressed because you can start just on the F sharp in this progression down from middle G, second line middle G for trumpets. Everybody else, you can transpose to uh, the notes in your instrument. That would be practical. I've just thrown it out here, for example, probably for trombone, I probably would be playing first position, uh, first position F, uh, that's fourth line F in the bass clef staff. I, for trombone people, I would probably start right there, first position. And uh, then, of course, you're going to have to bend it down without moving the slide, right? So you're going to find it very, very difficult. But that's just an example if you're playing another brass instrument. Uh, now let's go for the the quintessential granddaddy gold medal Olympic winner. Um, yeah, if you can get this one and control it, and I gotta be honest with you, sometimes in some days I can't get this one. That's how difficult it is. But that would be going down the tritone from G down to C sharp, um, D flat, and harmonic. Uh, this is. This is almost a nightmare to try to do on a regular basis and be consistent, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot right now. So we're playing our G down to D flat. Oh, almost didn't get it. Uh, folks, that was rough and tough, rough and tough and tumble. Uh, if you can do that and control it, um, um, you just certainly have to have chops. I would almost bet without hearing you playing anything else that you probably have a good core to your sound, amazing dynamics in all registers, and just great facility all over the horn, whatever brass instrument it is. So this was Kurt Thompson with another amazing proprietary and unique tip, trick, and technique for brass players that you've never heard before. And the date of this video will be its copyright. No one else has done the deep frozen lip bend. Try it. You'll like it. Comment below. I'll see you in the next one. You know, I've been kind of messing around doing the, the palming Dr. Charles Colin lip slurs and lip trills, and I've been finding it quite tough. I mean, you can't use any mouthpiece pressure. So I'll just give you an example. You know, you do the horn here. You know, it's palmed. You see, you make, you make your you make your hand. Now, French horn players will probably have to do this. 
Um, trombone players, maybe also. Baritone players, I'm not exactly sure how you would do that unless you could put your, like, you know how a tuba will put their tuba in a big tuba stand. And if you put the tube in the stand and you just went up to it with the mouthpiece like that, that would be almost the equivalent. So if you could put your euphonium or baritone in some kind of a stand, then you could probably get the technique we're after here. So you make your hand like a shelf. And I was just kind of messing around doing some lip troll, just seeing where I was at. Um, as you've heard in other past tutorials, I've been able to you know lip troll pretty decently up to triple G's. But that was using a tremendous amount of... Um, mouthpiece pressure would be at the very end. So that was pretty tough for me. But here I am. I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna just do it this way so you can see. That's the E D. Um, obviously that's E to G. G to B flat. B flat to C. So that was B flat to high C. Now, um, also I'm doing these rather loud. I would say that was just pushing probably forte. Uh, you're not going to get too much out of your lip trills in the Charles Colon book if you're playing them pianissimo or piano. Uh, I recommend all my students that were at, the, at least at the MF mark. MF to F is good. Probably fortissimo is not good. Um, you're going to be blowing so loud you're going to be de defeating the purpose of the technique. So keep these around MF to F. So that was... So B flat to high C. So palming. Now look, look how I got it. I don't know if you can see. Uh, I'm only using the weight of the horn. I'm not doing this. I'm not grabbing and pulling. There we go. Let's try to go a little higher. Now C to D. D to E. Now this will probably come out flat. And then, geez, I don't even know if I can make this last one. I can't get the G to lock in, but I will get it. So um, I was going for the trill from F to double G. I think it kind of came out. It got a little bit weak. Let's see if I can get it again. G now folks I'm probably making that look too easy so I want you to try it and why would I say I'm making it look too easy well uh, one of the techniques in my course does kind of focus on the Roy Stevens William Costello no pressure system palming now we're not doing it exactly as Roy would have had his students do because I'm not doing the the whole gap in the teeth thing and the forward jaw and the and the um upstream type of armature that is the Stevens armature so we're not really doing that but we're actually doing the physical exercise to kind of strengthen up our chops so the, the reason I mentioned that, that that might have looked too easy is because when people come into my course a lot of people have trouble just doing this <laughs> Just going to the E. Now that's just a slur going up. I would say more than half the people getting in my chorus cannot do what I just did there. That was simply going up to a high G. Low C, G, C, E, G. And to go up the next one, now we're going to whittle out almost all people that start my chorus. That's the B flat. I might, if I had 10 people start my course um, over the last quarter, uh, maybe two would be able to do what I just did there. And then finally, I don't know. If I had 
10 people start my course over the live course now, the one that they're seeing me every week live, uh, either via Skype or on the phone, uh, maybe one, one would be able to do what I just did right there. And that's just a maybe. So take this technique to heart in this drill, and it's a good challenge. I mean, we're all uh, brass players, and it seems like brass players, and especially trumpet players, like to like a good challenge and the competition and a challenge ourselves. And wow, can you think of a better challenge than this? Yeah, because I mean, come on. If I got on normally. I mean, what the hell? I just did a, you know, that lip trill from double C to double D. And if I warm up a little bit more, I know it can go another three or four steps higher. Because I'm playing normally and got the right pressure that I want. So this shows you, you saw that I got, I kind of, I kind of thinned out um, going up to that double G lip trill in it. So um, if, if I can go an octave higher playing normally, you know there's something to this technique. And I highly recommend that you start playing around and challenging yourself. Think outside the box, use your brain. Uh, you have to constantly keep moving upwards and expanding everything and advancing your horn. It doesn't stop. It hasn't stopped with me. I'm still looking at, at areas. Um, right now I'm looking at the jazz area. Although I feel like for a guy that's, you know, done it for, I haven't, I'm not even really seriously doing it, but I am looking at it. I am doing some different things with the 